Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, the bad news is that this morning I woke up sounding like a Disney villain. Um, but the good news is that, like all good ministers, I made a policy decision, and I'm going to talk until my voice runs out, at which point um, Natalie and Indra and all of you are going to take over talking, um, because the best thing that can happen with a politician is that they listen instead of talking. Um, so this is probably the best thing that could have happened today. Um, now, I know that uh, my boss, Matt Hancock, and the brilliant Matthew Gould, CEO at NHS, have already spoken this week about our immediate plans um, for NHS Health Tech. So I get um, to do the very best thing, uh, which is uh, to look a bit further forward at the future of the NHS. Now, all of us uh, will know someone who is living with uh, cancer or heart disease or diabetes or some equally debilitating or an often all too preventable illness. And the costs uh, to this country are immense. Uh, diabetes costs the UK economy 23.7 billion. Cardiovascular disease, 29.1 billion. Cancer, 18 billion. Mental illness, 94 billion. And of course, statistics like that can't possibly convey the scale of suffering, often hidden suffering, that they represent. Uh, as the NHS turns 71, I think we should be incredibly proud um, of what of its achievements, an extraordinarily dedicated workforce and uh, world, -livering, world leading um, underpinned by some of the most forward thinking medical researchers and innovators. But as the percentage of our population living with chronic and complex illness rises inexorably, I think we do have to face the facts that NHS care, while it will save your life, it will also completely consume your life if you are living with a chronic illness. It was never designed to deal with the huge growth in chronic disease, which now represents over 80% of healthcare spending. This, the present healthcare system is, it is too much, I think, what we could call a sick care system. It's largely still bricks and mortar, where people who are sick or acutely ill come to be seen and treated by medically trained people. Now that made sense when stroke or heart attack or HIV diagnosis was a death sentence in most, case, most cases. But um, we've made tremendous progress now uh, on diagnosis and treatments and those prognoses have changed. Um, but care delivery structures have struggled to keep pace with quite how differently patients experience healthcare today. At the moment, it's still the case that if you don't feel well, uh, you might see your GP, have a few preliminary tests and follow-up appointments. If that doesn't fix it, you'll be transferred on to um, a hospital specialist who'll do a few more tests and scans, have those re results looked at, and if you're lucky, you'll then get the right treatment. Even if the condition is relatively straightforward to diagnose, it can take a long time. And, and navigating that process when you're sick, it can be confusing, it's frustrating, it's an anxious experience, and the longer it takes, the sicker you get. Um, if you have a rarer or hard-to-treat disease, like me, that, pro that process can stretch to years. Uh, in my case, that took 30 years, and a few more years until my condition could be considered well-managed. And during that time, while I was undiagnosed, uh, misdiagnosed, um, and uh, unmanaged. I was not only pretty miserable a lot of the time, um, but I was costing the NHS a complete fortune in uh, inappropriate tests, in repeated trips to A&E, um, and um, my GP, and of course a merry-go-round um, of specialists who weren't the right specialist for me. And the parts of the NHS that have begun to change this are those that have shifted their perspective um, to design their systems from the perspective of the patient. Tower Hamlets is one of the most deprived parts of London, where the social determinants of ill health, unemployment, poor housing, debt, isolation, are all around us. Um, for two decades now, Bromley and Bow Health Centre has been pioneering a uniquely holistic and tech-enabled combination of integrated medical care um, and social prescribing. Um, from rolling out telecare and video consultations and self-care like uh, the diabetic care packages to enabling patients to self-manage their condition to digitally referring patients for debt advice, language courses and art therapy. This is a shift in focus from just treating patients for the presenting illness 
to actually helping patients to understand the drivers that impact their chronic condition better, which means that they can play a more active role in managing it. And it's a, the seamless integration of health tech into their day-to-day -day practice, which means that the health centre can save precious time in appointments. It means that patients are far more effectively monitored and managed. And it means that doctors have the capacity to be more human. It means that getting involved in health rather than just sickness, supporting and coaching patients in relation to their sleeping, their eating, their smoking and drinking and exercise, as well as aspects of managing their condition uh, properly, such as their adherence to medicine. Um, and the aim is to proactively keep them well, rather than just react when they become ill. Um, and it's also not just about telling them what to do. Uh, because, of course, people who smoke mostly know that it's bad by now. Um, it, but they need to be truly engaged, providing them with both the information but also with the smart tools so they can um, uh, properly, closely monitor themselves. Um, having devices that will constantly measure the likes of heart rate, blood pressure, uh, breathing or weight. Um, indeed, many of us already do that. I daily monitor my heart rate and my blood pressure um, using apps so that I can titrate my medication. This is my normal, um, and it is just the same for many diabetics, kidney patients, and many more patients with chronic illness. Uh, but in the future, uh, this will also become the normal uh, for many other healthy patients. We're essentially talking about a 24-hour connection between the patient and those monitoring and caring for them. Patients live with their condition 24-7, and our care should reflect that. One study that is thinking um, about healthcare in this way is the Technology Integrated Health Management Testbed for Dementia. Um, this uses a network of internet-enabled devices installed in a person's home in combination with AIS to enable clinicians to remotely monitor a patient's health around the clock. Um, and it's helping uh, to improve support for people with dementia and their carers um, so that they can remain more independent in their own homes uh, for longer. Now, the vision that I'm ske sketching out here is one where, for instance, a GP uses their tablet ultrasound to uh, make a movie of a patient's heart. Companies like Ultromics are already demonstrating solutions for this. When irregularities are flagged, the GP can immediately uh, share that with a cardiologist to diagnose the patient and make a care plan there and then. No need for an appointment weeks or months in advance. The issue can be dealt with in real time. Now, this is what we've all become accustomed to when we book flights or do our finances or shopping online. And I have to say, as a patient who is in the system, I can tell you nothing is more frustrating than the tempo of appointments. To stay on a specialist's list you have to accept a distant appointment in six or 12 months' time in advance when you may or may not be unwell. But happily, it is an eminently solvable problem. Uh, companies like Doctor Doctor um, and others are already being hugely helpful in helping us uh, mitigate the issue. But we're going to have to go an awful lot further if we want to deliver NHS long-term plan commitments to digital-first primary care, to redesigning outpatient care to address this, and of course to embedding AI for diagnostics, starting with the five new centres uh, for excellence for digital pathology and imagery, which are aiming to do exactly this, to cut down manual reporting, free up more staff time for direct patient care, but also find ways to speed up diagnosis of diseases. But we know that it can be done already, uh, because in East London they've established e-clinics um, in order to improve the management of chronic kidney uh, disease and reduce end-stage uh, renal disease. The new st uh, service uh, supports timely provision of advice from hospital specialists to GPs, doing exactly what uh, you could do uh, with cardiology, enabling better management of the patient in the community with specialist care where needed. A single pathway has been produced from primary to secondary care with rapid access to specialist advice. Since the e-clinic began in December 2015, 50% of referrals are managed without the need for a hospital appointment, and the average waiting time for a renal clinic appointment has fallen to five days from 64 days in 2015. We all know that patients are still going to need specialists with expert knowledge, but the patient and the specialist don't have to be in the same place at the same time. A network of connected care means that several experts can look at a case simultaneously. It can enable early diagnosis of health issues by constant monitoring before issues become more serious, before patients get sicker. And not only will this help 
patients, obviously, by reducing long waits for diagnosis, but it also obviously frees up clinicians, ensuring that they can spend their time caring for patients quickly rather than waiting on admin and logistics. And even the sickest patients can benefit. Uh, in the US, a trial of 766 cancer patients at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York tested an app reporting in real time their symptoms and side effects while undergoing chemo. Uh, the app allowed doctors and nurses to monitor the patient's uh, recovery and follow up with additional treatment options. And if a patient's side effects were severe or worsening, uh, nurses received an email alert so that they could call a patient to follow up and make sure the doctor reached out to the patient later. Um, in this study, um, patients uh, were undergoing, had, they had metastatic cancers and were undergoing chemo, so they were very sick. And uh, what uh, came out at the end of the study was that patients lived on average five months longer um, they, those who did, than those who did not lose the, use the tool. They experienced a better quality of life. They had fewer visits to the emergency room and fewer hospitalizations. By using what well, is essentially a simple tool, they removed a barrier to proactive collections and communications about the patient's symptoms. Um, it simply improved communications between the patient and the clinician because it didn't put the onus on the patient to pick up the phone to the doctor because patients are reluctant to complain, essentially. Um, this, these findings are now being confirmed in a larger clinical trial, but it shows the benefit of having a constant flow of information between the patient and the clinician, and it shows that it can genuinely be life-extending. This is going to be normal practice in 10 years. The idea of maintaining people's well-being instead of reacting to an episode, it all makes sense. Um, but we know that it's going to be hard changing the system that is hardwired to be more reactive. But it is how it's going to be in the future. So the NHS is now engaged in one of the largest digital health and social care transformation programs in the world. It's investment of more than half a billion a year nationally, with a lot more spend locally. Um, but we all know that it presents challenges. Firstly, we need to get the basic infrastructure structure right so that the data feeds AIS um, in the right format and is appropriately protecting um, the patient data. Uh, this is why NHSX is so focused on open standards as was set out in the tech vision uh, last year and I know that this has already been discussed from this platform. Second, we need to make sure that staff um, from healthcare professionals to managers and commissioners do have the skills they need to feel confident in using or procuring technologies. Otherwise, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, and that's why a lot of work is going on um, to implement the Topol Review to support the NHS Digital Academy um, and to work with um, CIOs across the system to raise the capability throughout the system. And thirdly, we of course have to encourage uptake. Um, the average time it takes for new technologies to percolate um, through the NHS at the moment is 17 years. Um, that is too long. Um, with that pace of technology, technology development, um, this is not viable. Um, so we need to make sure that once a technology has been proven uh, to deliver benefits to patients or the system, uh, that um, it will go throughout the system. And that is why NHSX is coming together with the Accelerated Access Collaborative to make a pathway from ideation through to implementation at scale that is more streamlined. Um, that is what uh, Matthew Gould is leading with uh, Sam Roberts at the AAC. And a major step um, has been NHSX's commitment to creating an environment for innovation to flourish with products for citizens and staff built by the market wherever possible, with a focus on supporting a system to set standards and raise capability both in skills and in technology. Uh, but to deliver this vision, um, NHS organisations are going to have to buy the technology that they actually need and not just what the market wants to sell them. Um, so the NHSX um, have three priorities um, which are focused on how we can make things better for patients and staff as soon as possible uh, because if you get buy-in from the system, things are going to move a lot quicker. So cutting the amount of time that clinicians spend inputting and accessing data in NHS systems will win you a lot of friends. Uh, making it easier for patients to access key NHS services on their smartphone and ensuring essential diagnostic information can be accessed safely and reliably from wherever pa a patient is in the NHS. That wins my vote. Um, however, it is not just about improving systems and making more cutting edge tech available. Um, to be able to make the NHS work seamlessly in a digital age, uh, we also have to think about the ways we use the data. 
Um, it, this is another priority for the NHS. It's to create a data-driven ecosystem. It's not only about allowing patients to better access their own data, but it's also about ensuring that relevant clinical, genomic, phenotypic, behavioral, and environmental data from across a range of sources can be circulated between patients, clinicians, and care systems. A closed-loop system like that can provide actionable advice to people before problems become significant and demand for services can then be predicted in advance. This is a proactive, not reactive system. This is where we want to go. But that's not to say that um, data isn't already being used in innovative ways in the NHS. Um, there are some examples of outstanding practice, and I know that many of them uh, will have been spoken about already um, at this conference. And early results from um, our data-driven eco survey, ecosystem survey, which I know uh, might have been raised already, um, show that 51% of those developing AI AIS solutions are building them for people with long-term conditions a, a, a long-term plan priority, 72% for clinicians, and 58% um, developing them for the purpose of improving quality of life and experience of care, and 76% to improve the system efficiency. And just last week, I met with uh, an extraordinary group who are working at the Institute for Cancer Research um, about the potential for AI to improve the speed and accuracy of drug discovery. Um, as part of their work, they've created a database that uses AI to discover the cancer treatments of the future. They, their system is called CANSAR. It's the biggest disease database of its kind anywhere in the world with almost 5 million um, experimental results. It's freely available to help researchers worldwide, and it's already driving dramatic advances in drug discovery to identify 46 potentially druggable cancer proteins that have been previously overlooked. This is the level of opportunity which is out there. And we have a responsibility to capitalize on those opportunities, ensuring that we don't miss our chance to save lives and money. But to do it, we have to make sure that we do it in the right way, within standardized, ethically, and socially acceptable frameworks. Um, the fair and ethical use of health data by researchers and commercial partners can deliver better patient outcomes, improve safety, and contribute to a thriving economy. But while we promote the latest data-driven scientific advances in healthcare, we have to ensure that patient data is respected and properly protected, and that, because that is the only way that we will maintain patient and clinician trust. We must have their buy-in if this is to continue. Getting the foundations right matters hugely, ensuring that we can um, go forward. Last December, we published five guiding principles for the use of NHS data, along with plans to establish a national center for expertise that will provide NHS organizations with the highest quality commercial and legal expertise. We've road-tested and developed these principles and plans for the center in partnership with a wide range of stakeholders. Um, and this really matters because um, in that survey that I mentioned earlier, 62% of those who completed the survey um, um, said that they were using personal data to develop their AIS systems. 49% got access to the data from NHS acute hospital trusts, but only 38% believe that the trust is the data controller and nearly 30% of responders didn't know what type of commercial arrangement they had in place. This demonstrates that there remains some confusion out there about what framework we need to have in place. So this is why we've put um, some basic rules of the road in place. It is why we are testing them um, with a range of stakeholders. Um, and that is why we have put in place plans for a center um, in partnership with a wide range of stakeholders across the NHS organizations, academic research, medical research charities, and the life sciences industry. We're going to publish an update and next steps on this work shortly. Um, and um, ahead, we're going to have a full policy framework for data sharing partnerships later this year. This is to establish certainty so that people can go forward in the full knowledge that they can innovate and they can invest in confidence about what the rules of the road are. Um, I'm delighted that we're going to be able to work with real experts in this space, um, including uh, Natalie Banner from Understanding Patient Data, um, because she, they lead on phenomenally important participatory research designed to ensure that the ecosystem we're creating keeps society in the loop by making use of research methods um, that keep people regularly 
really engaged throughout the design process. And I'm really uh, looking forward to having a discussion with her and hearing about how we in the centre um, can learn from her expertise and that of all of you here about how we can ensure that we maintain public and clinician trust as we do move forward to a data-driven future, one that is more proactive and not reactive. Um, because I know that each and every one of you here does believe, as I do, that data can save more lives. And I know that all of you also want to play your full role in doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Um, now, it takes me great pleasure as well to invite to stage uh, the lead for understanding patient data. Some of you may not know what that is, but you'll hear plenty about it later. They are a branch of the Wellcome Trust, something like that. Um, so, Natalie, can we welcome you to the stage, please? And um, in true sort of COGEX style, we're going to have what we call a fireside chat between Natalie and Nicola. And then if we've got time at the end, we'll open the floor up to some questions. So over to you. Thanks very much, Indra. Uh, thank you for the introduction. And, uh, and welcome, everyone. Fantastic to see such a packed stage. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Baroness Spruckler. I hope your voice holds out, because uh, there's plenty to talk about. Um, so as Indra said, my name is Natalie Banner. I lead an initiative called Understanding Patient Data, which is hosted at Welcome. I think that's the way we describe it. Uh, it's technically an independent initiative, um, and, and our role is to talk more about the way that data that's collected in health records can be used for research. Um, and we'll come on to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so, Baroness Spruckler, thank you so much for that, that fantastic vision. Um, it's, it's such an exciting time and I think anyone who's been wandering around the, the conference will see just how much buzz and excitement there is about the potential for, for data and new technologies um, to really drive differences, make an impact in society and change lives. Um, but I just wanted to start off asking you um, about your own journey and experience. You, you spoke just now about uh, the diagnostic odyssey that you faced um, in, in, in understanding, learning about managing your own long-term condition. Um, I know that both your parents worked in the NHS as well, so you, it, you had a lot of, sort of experience in, in with the healthcare system. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to ask you how you feel those experiences have shaped your, your views on research and innovation um, and, and your priorities as a minister. I think um, the clear way in which that's shaped my experiences. I see everything from a patient's perspective, inevitably, um, and every time I look at a policy that comes across my desk, I think, will this get patient and clinician buy-in? Because if it doesn't have patient and clinician buy-in, I know that it's just going to be a dusty policy document that sits on my desk. Maybe NHS England will back it, but then it will just stop at the door and it won't go anywhere. And so that's the, f the first impact that it's had. Um, the second thing is that I know that as a patient, um, the frustrations that I've had in um, not being able to access my own medical records, in the paucity um, of research because data can't be shared, um, because doctors feel like they aren't able to share records because sometimes because of urban myths, sometimes because of actual legislative barriers about data sharing, um, because of the uh, legacy which we have because of care.data and how what the political battle which we had to overcome it. And so it brings, I suppose, a personal mission to the way in which I engage with the health data, um, uh, uh, the health data policy area um, because I know that this isn't about um, just getting um, the just getting um, the, uh, the, the lines right in my department. This is about actually saving lives, but it's also about transforming lives on a smaller level. Um, if you just want to get your um, own, if you, if you just want to go to the, get your prescription and the, you have a barrier in getting your prescription, that can actually create, you know, a, that can make you sick in a way that wouldn't be the case for somebody who doesn't have a serious illness. And so I suppose I have just more granular understanding of that. 
Yeah, for, for those of you who might have been here um, a couple of days ago, on, on Monday we had a, a fantastic panel um, a, 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 of patients and it, we were talking about how to sort of make uh, the development of medicine and technology more patient-centric. And, um, and we had a, a great keynote speaker, Jess Mills, who is the, the daughter of Tessa Jowell and who's founded a fantastic charity, Act for Cancer. And something that she said really, really struck me. She said, you know, most patients, just, they want to get back to their ordinary lives. They don't want their lives to be dominated by having to manage all of these things, whether it's prescriptions or a Appointments, as you pointed out, um, so I think that's that's a, that's such a powerful uh, a powerful notion to kind of to hold on to. I, th I think as well, um, at a certain point, you start giving up. You start giving up trying to navigate your way through the system. And there was a moment in 2016. It was that recent <laughs> uh, when I was really sick, um, and I was fainting pretty much every day because my blood pressure and heart rate were so unmanaged, and no one had managed to work out how I could titrate my medication and I'd been put on, I, I'm on off-label medication so there's no right amount that I should take or any individual should take um, and because I was taking the wrong dose as it, for me as it turned out I, I was just on the wrong amount and I kept trying to get back to my specialist and my GP didn't feel confident in um, prescribing for me and I almost just stopped taking everything, but I knew that that would make me sicker, and I felt completely boxed in, because as a patient, you, you don't have anywhere that you can go. You can't access your specialist, because it's a six months or a year to get to your specialist, and your GP doesn't feel confident, because you're on off-label medication, and they, don't, they can't get you in any quicker, because you're in a very rare specialty. Um, and so you, you then have to make a judgment. Is it better to take the medication and be sick from the medication or is it better to change the medication? And my solution was tech. It was monitoring the effect of my medication um, on my heart rate and blood pressure and titrating accordingly. And in the end, I as a patient took control of my condition and managed to resolve it. Now, I don't believe that that should be the case. I don't believe that I as a patient should have had to resolve that. I think we should have been able to have a system where I should have been given the information and the tools to be able to manage that much more effectively much earlier. And that is why, as I set out earlier, if we give patients the information and the smart tools to manage their care earlier, if we can diagnose patients earlier before they get sicker, we will be able to be proactive, not reactive. And we will not have patients in the situation where I was in, where I was literally experimenting with my drug regime. It seems so shocking in this day and age that that's, that's where it got to. And, and presumably, you know, as someone who's quite digitally savvy, quite engaged with this, that was probably an easier process for you than it would be for, for many people who perhaps aren't, uh, whether they're not online or not, you know, familiar with using smart tools and, and technology and so on. How do you feel that we can ensure that this kind of technology and this, the, the potential for this sort of technology can actually spread it across the population, particularly to those people who might not otherwise be engaged uh, with technology, with smartphones, with you know, working online and that sort of thing? Well, one of the things uh, which I'm really excited about is the work that um, Indra and, um, is, is doing with NHSX um, and also the work that's going on at AAC where we're literally going to go out and we're going to search the examples of best practice up and down the country um, and pull them out and spread them across the country because we've worked out that there are some places in the NHS that are doing an outstanding job, places such as Tower Hamlets um, where I wouldn't probably have been in the position um, that I was in. And um, we're going to identify those examples where they have been proven within the system. Um, and we're going to find ways to spread them throughout with using our AHSN network, using other um, uh, ways to make sure that we drive innovation through quicker than 17 years um, and um, ensure that we can give patients the technology uh, that they need, uh, but also give them the information that they need so that they can feel empowered. Um, and we're going to make sure that we put patients at the center um, of that innovation process. Um, and that's one of uh, the reasons uh, that we're excited about uh, the Center for Expertise. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so, that, I mean, there's a huge amount of buzz around, around technology and, and AI and healthcare and so on. And, and you've spoken fantastically about some of the brilliant examples, the sort of pockets of innovation that are happening right across the country. Um, but can I ask, what, what's the thing you're most excited about for the next couple of years in terms of, of technology and healthcare? Is there, is there one thing that you'd pick out? Um, 
I was really um, absolutely overwhelmed by my visit to um, the in Institute for Cancer Research and the work that they're doing, where I really do feel that they are going to cut down dramatically on the clinical trials process, and we may well see transformational cure-like um, cancer drugs coming down the road, but at a much lower price, and that's really exciting. Um, but that will, of course, um, trans those processes will, of course, transfer to many other um, areas, and that's really um, groundbreaking. That was a commitment that we made in our life sciences strategy and sector deal to look at the opportunities uh, which that presents. Um, the second area, which I think is going to be um, hugely transformational, um, is AI for radiology and pathology um, to speed up um, diagnosis diagnosis and screening, uh, which will mean that we'll be much more able to um, spot uh, disease earlier um, and intervene more in terms of risk profiling rather than um, in terms of responding once someone is sick. Um, there's a lot of work um, that we're doing in terms of our uh, genomic program. We really lead the world in terms of genomics where uh, we really are the only place in the world where our research in genomics and sequencing actually feeds into clinical care. Um, and we are rolling out uh, across the NHS a genomics medicine service so that um, at the moment one in four rare disease patients who are participants in that are getting a diagnosis for the first time. Um, this is groundbreaking. It's extraordinary and exciting. Um, but what would be even more exciting is where healthy participants um, could start having um, risk profile and um, really quite early um, uh, science is coming through that polygenic risk scores and areas like that could be used um, alongside other um, uh, other forms of risk scoring um, in order to identify risks um, quite early on and um, we could use that as a form of screening and so there are some emerging forms um, of uh, of screening, which mean that we could start becoming um, really a much healthier nation and we could really start addressing the demand on the system. So those who do have um, genetic diseases who will be sick will actually be able to get the personalised care within the system um, that at the moment it's really challenging to give them. Yes, and I think with genomics, the, you know, the, the promise of personalised medicine has been around for, for quite some time. People have been talking about it for, for quite a few years, and there's the, there's the different P's, which I always forget. It's the, the personalised, predictive, I've got them noted here, preventive and, and participatory, uh, which I think is the interesting other, other P. Uh, you, you mentioned, you, you trailed, trailed the, um, the National Genomics Strategy at Rare Disease Day early this year, and I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about your, your plans for that and where you see um, the, the role of government in taking steps to really drive forward the potential for, for personalised medicine, particularly around genomics? Well, one of the really exciting things when I started this job for a second time, because um, obviously I was a minister before, and I came back in and I saw we've had a huge flourishing in genomics. And we've not only got Genomics England, which does the main sequencing with the NHS, we've got UK Biobank, um, which is an extraordinary research facility with longitudinal um, and um, phenotypic and genotypic um, studies. Um, but we've also got um, a huge number of other projects that are going on, as well as the private sector. And what I felt was we needed to just make sure that everybody was pointing in the same direction and that our, we were clear what our aim was with genomics as a nation. Not only so that we um, made sure that we sent a clear signal to researchers and innovators about what we were doing, um, but also so that we were clear with patients and clinicians about what our ethical standards were, frameworks were, what our public private um, data sharing frameworks were, and so on. And so one of the key um, priorities for the National Genomic Strategy is to set that out very clearly. Um, and for me, one of the priorities is we need to make sure that we maintain this really outstanding homeostatic cycle that we have in genomics of research into clinical care and back again because that is our outstanding strength in genomics. The second thing is to make sure that we are always clear that what we want to get out of genomics is not um, a lot of data and a lot more data but functional data where we can actually take action and go forward with taking action because it's great to find out more and more from genomics. Um, but what we actually want to do is improve care for patients. And so um, that will be uh, the direction that we're going in. Um, and what I really want to make sure is that we maintain uh, patients at the heart of this, that we have um, a clear um, participatory um, uh, 
group in the middle, our Justice Genomics England have led the way on, in fact, um, that we have clear methods for consent and standards for data sharing, and that we have, um, you know, we, we leverage our, you know, our world-leading ethical and legal um, institutions in making sure that we think very carefully about where we're going, because this is an area that very few nations have thought carefully about. Absolutely, and, and you mentioned sort of public-private partnerships there, and, and of course, you know, we're here at a, at a tech conference. There's huge amounts of innovation. There's an awful lot of uh, commercial interest um, in the NHS um, and in the potential for for using and developing new data-driven technologies w within it, and so on. Um, and, and I think the NHS, and I think it's fair to say public perception of the NHS, has a slightly uneasy relationship with, with industry. Uh, people are anxious about the role of commercial interests, um, and particularly when it comes to the use and sharing of, of data, data that's collected in the NHS and data in health records, you know, there is, there is a low level of trust and there's a lot of anxiety about what people might be doing with the data, where it might be going, what the rules are, and so on. Um, and so I just wanted, uh, and, and you mentioned Memorial Sloan Kettering, which on the one hand has, has these fantastic examples of what they're doing, but there was also a huge backlash uh, when it was discovered that, that some of the directors of, of, of that organization were potentially uh, going to create a new company that could use the scans that they had built up an archive over, over many, many years. And there was a lot of anger that that was sort of seen as potentially being slightly exploitative. Um, and so I, I, I guess uh, as a Minister for Innovation, how do you negotiate that very, very difficult terrain um, of uh, enabling and ensuring innovation and, the, and that the NHS is available to um, as, a, as a kind of test bed um, and to really get the, the best cutting edge uh, new technologies and so on against this anxiety um, and concern about, about public trust and trying to ensure that we actually do get sort of buy-in from patients and clinicians as well um, for the technologies that, that are being developed. Well, I mean, one of the things is um, that having been in government for a very long time, I mostly have learned that it's n almost never conspiracy. It's mostly always cock-up. Um, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> The problem is that you need to make sure that everybody else knows that as well. So uh, the first thing is to make sure that you do genuinely talk to people and engage with people. Um, so um, I have spent a lot of time engaging with um, representative groups, but also actual people, which I think matters quite a lot. Um, so going out on visits, but also um, talking to um, those who really know what they're talking about, because obviously, while I am a patient and have a certain kind of um, professional patient experience, I'm not an expert. Um, so knowing who the experts are and getting the advice, that matters. Secondly, um, consulting and being transparent and open about your process as you develop it, rather than sort of just dumping your policy on people after you've developed it and not allowing people the opportunity to engage as the process is developed because actually with the best will in the world even if you are trying to do the right thing you often miss things you know um, you, you can't be all seeing all knowing and so um, having a, 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 a you know a, a co-production process um, is really valuable um, as as a government because it makes it better and so we, we do that um, the next thing is having clear transparent rules of the road because it works for us, um, and it works, I think, for industry. I think it works for investors. If everybody knows what the rules are, and they're um, then um, enforced clearly and in, with certainty and consistently. And that's why we brought in the AI Code of Conduct, um, which was um, uh, it, which was uh, it, which was developed in exactly this way, in an iterative way. Um, that's why we're bringing in um, the data principles um, to make sure that um, public-private um, uh, uh, engagement on, on data is going to have a clear set of codes, and we're doing this also in an iterative way. Um, and we're going to keep doing this um, to make sure that everybody understands uh, what the rules are, how they will be enforced, but everybody also um, has uh, engages with us on how we develop it to make sure that we don't build in unintended incentives um, or disincentives, uh, because that's not what we're trying to do. Fantastic. So. Um there are some really brilliant examples, as you've said, going on all across the country. Um, and, and you've talked about the desire to sort of identify what's happening there and, and see, if it can be, see if it can be scaled or, or, or expanded and rolled out further. What are the sort of key challenges and barriers you think uh, that exist uh, at the moment? Because obviously there's huge energy and there's huge enthusiasm and, there, and there's, it seems like there's a lot going on. But, um, but what's kind of holding it up at the moment, do you think? Well, I think 
We've done a lot in terms of uh, the regulatory space um, and we're doing a lot in terms of clarifying uh, what the rules are and we're making a lot of progress on that. I think uh, the key barrier at the moment is uh, the NHS being low and slow on uptake and that's why um, we've done the work that we have in terms of uh, putting in place NHSX and the AAC in order to address that. Um, the barriers I think are in terms of infrastructure, capability and uh, investment. On the first two, um, I think that we are doing um, an awful lot um, in terms of um, addressing that. Obviously, we've put in place uh, the NHS Digital Academy to raise skills, and NHS uh, X is going to be um, doing a lot to try and raise capability in terms of procurement by having individuals in there who have commercial expertise to assist those within trusts when they are engaging uh, with industry in terms of um, just raising their confidence in making deals. Because sometimes it can feel um, quite stressful if you're going to take a risk on um, bringing in um, a new innovation um, when you know you may be facing a risky winter you may not feel like you have much capacity and if you're going to change your um, vendor you might think oh I'm, I'm just not sure I can take that risk this winter so you might just feel like you need to have a bit of support. And so NHSX is going to be part of that support network over the next little while while we raise capability across the system. Um, the GDE process is also part of that, um, but NHSX is, is, we think, going to be a game changer in this area. Um, AAC um, is also going to be looking at procurement processes, is going to be looking at ev proving evidence, because one of the real frustrations, uh, we think, is that you have to go and prove your case 209 times in every CCG. You shouldn't have to do that. Um, and so uh, these barriers are things that we're looking at really closely um, to see how we can smooth the system and make a much more seamless approach to going through the regulatory process and to market uh, much more effectively where you have proven that the NHS wants your product. You have to prove that bit, sorry. We can't do that for you. <laughs> it's interesting you talk about risk aversion um, because I think that's something that uh, with understanding patient data we've come across very, very clearly this idea that, well, we want to engage with patients and it sounds like a good thing to do and everyone sort of nods and agrees and says, oh, it's terribly, terribly important to engage with patients. But then actually doing it in practice, there's a huge amount of nervousness um, around doing that and, and actually just going out and talking to people, um, um, as you say. Um, so I think it, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting challenge, both in terms of the kind of the practicalities of, of procuring and understanding technology and, and getting those bits right, but also if you're serious about the public trust bit, actually going and talking to people and figuring out how to do that engagement, where you're going to have a diversity of views, you're not going to get complete agreement, people have different levels of willingness to, uh, to take on risk and, um, and to sort of be open to the idea of potential commercial incentives in the NHS and so on, you're going to have a huge amount of diversity. Um, how on earth do you manage that when it comes to having to then make a policy decision? So you do the engagement and it's brilliant and you get lots and lots of interesting views, but then you actually have to translate that into getting, actually deciding on some rules. <laughs> how do you manage that diversity of views? Well, you make a judgment. Um, based on all the you know various information uh, which you have, um, but you know when it comes to public trust, I mean trust is earned, um, and it's a process. And public opinion is dynamic as well; it changes over time based on experience. Um, I mean we we've looked at evidence, and you you have shared this evidence with us as well that you know patients are much more keen to share health data when they or a family member have been sick. Um, and will be likely to engage in um, participatory research um, in that um, situation. And so you, we can't put people into buckets of, you know, this person is willing to share health data, this person will be willing to be engaged in um, commercial um, activity. People aren't like that. We change our minds. Um, and so the point is that as a, as a government and as a sector, we have to earn public trust that we are going to use health data for the right purposes and that we can be trusted with what we will do with that health data going forward. We have to earn clinician trust that the way that we engage and we build this ecosystem um, will work 
um, that it will be competent, it will be effective, uh, that there won't be risks, that there won't be data losses, that there won't be breaches, that the security uh, will be built in. Um, that is part of the purpose of putting in place um, the tech visions, interoperability standards, the cybersecurity standards, so that people can look at that and they can have confidence that these will be the standards that the system will be built to. And as this develops and as the process goes, more and more confidence uh, will be built in it and we will earn that trust from the public. Um, but I don't think that that is a static thing. My personal view is you have to keep earning public and patient trust um, and there will always be incidents, there will always be um, issues that arise that you have to um, explain, that you have to take responsibility for and you have to um, accept the fact that um, as a sector we are responsible for dealing in something which is extremely precious and extremely personal. It's people's health and their most personal information and if we are going to deal in that then we have to accept that we are going to have to um, respond to a demand to be accountable to the public and to clinicians as to the standards and the interoperability which we are going to meet and that is the business which we are all in. Thank you and, and it's something we're you know, very much looking forward to working more with you on uh, with understanding patient data. You know our aim is to try and make the, the way that data that's collected in health records, how that's used for purposes beyond care more visible, more understandable and more trustworthy um, and I think it's, this is certainly a a very opportune time to be working in this working in this space and really uh, helping to drive uh, those standards and that vision um, for a future which I hope, think we can all agree sounds sounds fantastic if we can get it right. Um, so I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank Baroness Brackwood for uh, using the very last of her voice to talk to us this morning. I think you'll all agree it's been uh, a fascinating uh, discussion and thank you very, very much for your time. Will you join me in thanking Baroness Blackwood? <laughs>